Hello, Robs. We got a new book here. Well, it's not a new book, but I got a copy that has a dust jacket. Spooks Deluxe, Some Excursions into the Supernatural, as told to and recounted by Danton Walker. Nice little ghosts on the inside. Danton has found that ghosts manage to invade the lives of the most unexpected people. They came unbidden and not particularly welcome to all of the busy, noteworthy personalities who tell their own stories here at the risk of facing disbelief. Here and today in this book, ghosts appear in such odd places as an ultra-modern penthouse, a spanking new ranch house, a theater dressing room, even in the hectic city room of a metropolitan newspaper. These things don't happen, but they did. What ghostly influence told Guthrie McClintock to mail an unsent letter, which changed his whole career? What eerie agency caused the neighbor's mice to creep over into Mrs. Raymond Massey's cellar whenever death was an imminent guest? In the house across the street, and what ghost dared to come up and see Mae West? As told here by the famous Broadway columnist, these and other experiences come chilling, chillingly close to home. Let's see if I can pull out the old copy I have here. Let's see, there's my unsheathed regular copy, which I probably should read instead of using the good copy that I just picked up for 10 bucks. And then this says 15. Franklin Watts, Inc., New York, 1956, first printing. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-legged beasties and things that go bump in the night, kind Lord deliver us, Scottish. What shall we do with the introduction to begin with? How long is this? This is pretty, actually pretty long. Longer than most of the stories. To begin with, sure, I believe in ghosts. Why not? I believe in atomic energy and television, radio, the telephone, the electric eye, and a thousand other man-made miracles that we take for granted today, but which a century ago might have been ascribed to witchcraft. I believe in allergies, which at one time were ascribed to witchcraft. Hay fever was at any rate. And I believe in animal magnetism, malicious or otherwise, in that indescribable element that makes people fall in love. I believe in life and death, and who is to define them? Some people are born into the world colorblind or tone deaf or without a sense of smell. Do they think we're crazy because we can see, hear, or smell things they can't? I've never seen a ghost, and I hope I'll never see one, but plenty of other people have. I have read a great many stories on the supernatural, and there, nearly everyone begins... No, I don't believe in ghosts, but after which the writer proceeds to marshal an array of facts, figures, names, and dates, proving that he does believe in ghosts and hopes you will too. However, this book doesn't set out to prove anything. It is intended only as entertainment or, at the most, an exercise in hypothesis. The stories told herein are true. Otherwise, there would be no point in printing them. Anyone can make up a ghost story, and the tendency in recounting tales of the psychic or supernatural is to enlarge, exaggerate, or embellish them in the interest of making a better yarn. Better understatement than overstatement, I maintain, even at the risk of minimizing the drama, color, and suspense. Contact with professional people of reputation and standing in the course of interviewing them as a newspaper columnist, I soon blundered onto the fact that nearly every man jack of them what does that mean man jack that every man jack of them the hell does that mean had some experience that might by a slight stretch of nomenclature be called a ghost story and from then on i made a point of drawing them out on the subject no none of them believed in the supernatural yet each admitted that his experience could only belong in that category or at least in the realm of the supernormal or unexplainable in quite a few instances, having told their story, they immediately began to back away from it, declining permission to put it in print for fear that they might be ridiculed. Necessarily, then, many of the case histories are tantalizingly 
fragmentary and some anonymous, yet all deserve to be included as part of the evidence. Some of the experiences would seem to be utterly pointless, but none of the nonetheless valid. For example, Harriet Parsons, Luella Parsons' daughter, told me that she once dreamed of seeing a man riding a bicycle down the street in Los Angeles. She didn't know the man, but the dream left a distinct impression on her memory. Three days afterward, she did see the man riding down the self-same street in Los Angeles on a bicycle in the flesh and immediately recognized him. She didn't know him then or afterward and hadn't the slightest idea why she should have seen him in her dream or in real life. She was quite baffled by the whole experience. And the more you delve into the subject, the more baffling it becomes. In a superb collection of ghost stories collected by William Stevens called Unbidden Guests, there is an attempt made to break down ghosts in the categories such as quiet ghosts, noisy ghosts, ghosts with a mission, ghosts who sh merely come and go, etc. Haunting by the sense of smell seems to be one of the most familiar methods by which apparitions make their presence felt, and there are hundreds of such incidents on record. One of those cited by William Stevens, a classic example, concerned the Empress Eugenie of France, after the fall of the Third Empire, the Emperor, Empress, and their young son, Louis, took refuge in England. Louis, or Lulu, as his mother called him, was eventually given a commission in a British regiment and sent to South Africa, where he was killed by the Zulus. That was in 1879. The body was recovered and sent back to England, and a stone cairn set up by the river marking the spot where he died. It became an obsession with the Empress to find this spot, and she was eventually humored by the British government and permitted to go to Africa to find it. When the search party arrived, the Empress insisted on fighting her way through undergrowth that deterred even the guides, led on by the strong odor of violets, the scent that her son had favored in this toilet water and shaving lotion, and she found the cairn of stones marking the spot where the young prince had died. Ghost stories, of course, are as old as time. You'll find them in the Bible, and you'll find them in Shakespeare, who probably drew on actual incidents. Libraries everywhere are filled with them. Hereward Carrington, apparently the pen name for Hubert Lavington, a British-born editor and writer who has spent a lifetime investigating or writing about psychic phenomena, has a private library of some 7,000 volumes. Carrington collaborated with Nandor Fodor, a psychoanalyst on a book titled Haunted People. And Fodor's chapter on the psychoanalytic approach to the problems of occultism is probably the first original contribution to the subject in our time. Tennyson, Ruskin, Gladstone, Thackeray, Sir Walter Scott, and Victor Hugo are a few of the famous authors who have concerned themselves with tales of the psychic or supernatural. Edith Wharton, Henry James, Rudyard Kipling, and Conan Doyle are some of the more modern writers who have devoted their literary talents to the subject. And Satchaveral Sitwell rather recently turned out a tome on the subject of poltergeist, a rather special kind of ghost that is given to haunting people rather than places. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, has many references in his famous diary about apparitions seen by himself and his family. Not once, but many times. In fact, the haunting of Epworth Rectory, the Wesley family home, is one of the liveliest hauntings in history. Some students of the occult are inclined to include Joan of Arc's mysterious voices in the realm of the supernatural, as indeed they were. It is a matter of history that James IV of Scotland was visited by an apparition that warned him against an invasion of England. James ignored the warning and fell at Flodden Field. Napoleon, while incarcerated at St. Helena, told those about him that he had seen and conversed with the shade of Josephine, who warned him of his approaching end, and more recent, a more recent dictator who was reputed to have heard voices was Hitler. The story goes that he entertained familiars of the spirit world at his solitary mountain retreat at Berchtesgaden. Butchered that. Familiars who apparently misled him as badly and as deliberately as did the three witches of Macbeth. Ghosts in wartime are no novelty. There are innumerable instances on record. 
One of the favorite legends of World War I concerned an apparition of a woman who appeared frequently to Allied soldiers in the Belgian trenches and was known to them as the Angel of Mons. While on a boat going to Puerto Rico some years ago, I was entertained by an Army officer's story about an incident that happened during the Spanish Civil War. A loyalist night surprise raid on a rebel battery failed, it seems, because the commanding officer believed that he saw a horseman leading troops against his command. It developed later that the soldiers defending the battery were asleep at the time, and the attack undoubtedly would have succeeded. The officer was convinced that the mysterious horseman was the ghost of El Cid, legendary Spanish hero who died just before a battle and was strapped to his horse to lead a successful charge against the Moors. Psychic phenomena, especially anything dealing with haunted houses, is taken quite seriously in England, and ghosts under various guises are more or less taken for granted in Scotland, Ireland, and Wales. Guided tours through the great English estates, one way of raising tax money since World War II, usually play up the family ghost as part of the attraction. One London newspaper a year or so ago featured a long series of daily authenticated first-hand ghost stories submitted by readers. This popular series was run under the byline of Dennis Conan Doyle, son of the creator of Sherlock Holmes and was interrupted only by his death. In 1934, a group of prominent Britishers interested in things supernatural, Sir Oliver Lodge, an eminent scientist among them, inaugurated a series of broadcasts over BBC titled Inquiry into the Unknown. Sir Ernest Bennett, fellow of Hertford College, Oxford, initiated the broadcast with a scholar, scholar, scholarly address over the air on the subject of apparitions in haunted houses and appealed to his listeners to forward him their personal experiences documented as far as possible in the interest of science. This experiment could hardly be brushed off as silly, considering the names involved. A Lord Chief Justice of England, many titled folk, as well as clergymen, businessmen, and professional people were among the 1,300 who responded. Spooks deluxe indeed. Out of the mass of reports, Sir Ernest selected 50 collective cases, so-called because they included the testimony of two or more persons. Only in rare instances was the testimony of only one individual accepted, one exception being Lord Brougham, Chief Justice of England. The 50 cases, along with half a hundred others gathered by the British Society for Psychological Research, were assembled and published in a book titled Apparitions in Haunted Houses, a survey of evidence from which a preface was written by no less a personage than the Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral. Cambridge University was the first English-speaking educational institution to found a chair for psychical research, and Lord Balfour was president of the British Psychical Research Society at the time. At the same time, he was prime minister of England. After the death of Mackenzie King, prime minister of Canada, it was revealed that he, too, had had an ardent interest in spiritualism. During World War II, one of the New Deal's most prominent financial figures was in the habit of sending to New York for a nightclub fortune teller who would sit on, in on important meetings and give advice. The details of these sessions would have made extremely spectacular reading at the time. We in the United States are more skeptical than the British, or possibly more afraid of being ridiculed, if we evince too much interest in such things. But in recent times, our savants and scientists have been given considerable attention to a phase of psychic phenomena that has come to, to be labeled parapsychology or extrasensory perception, usually abbreviated ESP. Meetings have been held on both sides of the Atlantic solemnly to discuss findings along these lines as I fumble through the book to corral it. Invariably, there is some mention, invariably, there is mention of the experiment that has been going on for some years at Duke University. 
At Durham, North Carolina, Professor J.B. Ryan, after conducting a vast number of experiments in telepathy, concluded that certain individuals do unquestionably have ESB. Pardon? These tests, for the most part, involve such feats as reading off numbers or symbols from cards that were sealed in tin containers or were otherwise inaccessible to the subject. What useful purpose these experiments achieved isn't it immediately evident? Since mental telepathy is so commonplace that almost everyone has experienced it, so-called mind reading is practiced so successfully by entertainers who perform in theaters and clubs that one might be tempted to believe they were practicing some sort of black magic. The professional magician and professional mind readers usually insist that it's all done with tricks. However, one couple who do a mentalist act in the nightclubs, Eddie and Lucille Roberts, privately confessed to me that Lucille, working center stage blindfolded while her husband went about the audience asking questions, frequently gets the answers before Eddie has asked the questions. Eddie feels that such a close association over a period of 25 years might easily develop a sixth sense. Dr. Stanley Jacks, one of the most amazing professional magicians it has been my good luck to know, admitted to me that telepathy does play a large part in some of his tricks, but that he always denies it for publication. Most of the charlatans, he said, are people who do have a modicum of psychic ability, but are forced to resort to trickery when their talent runs out. One plausible theory on thought transference came from a Western electric engineer several years ago. After conducting some experiments of his own, he reached the conclusion that the human cranium itself contains the greatest sending and receiving apparatus in the world, one that is capable of transmitting or registering images or messages quite as accurately as a radio or television set, if it could be brought under one conscious control. More recently, a Harvard scientist attending the convention of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Dr. Mary A. Brazer of Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital, presented results on brain studies of a number of persons, which she claimed established the existence of two sensory nerve roots leading to the human brain. It is this nerve telegraph system, Dr. Brazer maintained, that explains extrasensory perception. Neither of these theories, however, could explain the eccentric activities of the human mind, which apparently on occasions not only contacts the past, but is able to reach into the uncharted future. The machine hasn't yet invented hasn't yet been invented that can trap a ghost, record a mental message, or accurately forecast the future. The sand div- diviners, tea leaf readers, or adepts with the crystal ball, and most certainly the astrologers, would seem to be still ahead of the scientific experimenters in this respect. In nine cases out of ten, the host to unexplainable and frequently pointless visitations is taken completely unaware while engaged in some main mundane occupation as cleaning house or computing his income tax. Apparently, ghosts don't work on schedule, nor, for that matter, does the human mind. And who is to define the boundaries of the human mind? Perhaps when we see or hear ghosts, it is because we ourselves riding that mental magic carpet, have ventured back into the past like the young man in Berkeley Square. In other words, it could be ourselves thus projected back into the past who are visiting the ghosts, rather than the ghosts who are visiting us. But this is a subject for endless speculation. It is quite likely also that many of the daily experiences we have might be regarded as supernatural, If we knew more about this fascinating subject, the businessman who acts on inexplicable hunches, the dice thrower who calls his shots before the bones have hit the floor, the newspaper editor or columnist who, out of 20 hot stories to choose from, invariably picks the one that will make tomorrow's sensational headlines, they may be using their psychic faculties no less than the soothsayer who purports to tell your future. 
However, as before stated, this book doesn't set out to prove anything. Of only one thing we can be sure, while perhaps everybody doesn't believe a ghost story, practically everybody loves a ghost story. So here, for your entertainment, are a few that have entertained me, just a few among the many. Many others I have heard, but I'm not permitted to tell. Danton, what's his name? Danton Walker? Danton Walker, New York, June 1956. And here are the stories that I'm not going to read today because i got to go to work. All right. Goodbye, bros. Goodbye.